Max, we're here together in BAMP, the fifth FQXI conference. I'm pleased it's my fourth. I was going to come no matter what the topic was. I was going to come <laughs> for sure. But when I saw it was the physics of the observer, I wondered, uh, the observer began about a century ago with quantum mechanics. And, 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 it, and it, at first blush, it seemed like not the level of importance that we had with time and information and multiverse, all these other big ideas. So why is the observer, the physics of the observer, so important? We've learned that, um, that what answer you actually get out of your mathematical theories of physics depends on how you define an observer. So, For example, if you uh, just start with pure quantum mechanics, just the math, you just have this thing called the wave function doing its thing, and <laughs> In order to calculate what we actually observe, that things happen with certain probabilities, the, the physicist Hugh Everett famously showed that you just have to assume one thing. You just have to assume that an observer is something that can take information in and remember it. From that, he was able to calculate all this stuff. This is the so-called Everett or many worlds interpretation. If you take instead the problem of making sense of modern cosmology, where well, you have this huge, maybe infinite, mess, diverse space that's been created by an inflationary expansion in our early universe, and you want to predict how much dark energy you should observe, then it turns out you instead get the right answer if you assume a little bit more about your observer, if you assume that it needs to have a galaxy to live in. And it, there's another thorny problem in quantum mechanics, which is a bit more subtle, that has to do with how you divide the world into different parts where I think you have to assume even more and, and say that an observer is something which is also conscious in order to get the right answer. So that's why it's so important that we, we really drill down and understand how we define an observer because it affects the predictions. So you've made two huge leaps. The first leap is that you need something to observe. The second one is that that observer might have to be conscious. Um, th those are very strong uh, uh, statements, and just the most obvious thing is the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and at the beginning a lot of quantum events were happening, and what kind of observers were there th at that point? Yeah, so that's another thing. Should we be surprised that we observe our universe to be 13.8 billion years old? Should, or is it, would it be much more likely that we observe it to be... 100 years old? Probably not, because it was too hot then to have any galaxies or any stable structures that could process information and, and think. Um, and um, if we live in a very diverse space and time where, for example, the amount of dark energy changes from place to place, we should expect to see the things that typical observers see. But what's typical it depends on what an observer is and this is a wide open question we've had fascinating debates about here at the conference and it's clear that even though people here don't agree about how we should define an observer i think they generally agree that the predictions our theories make depend on what we mean by an observer many physicists here have told me that their concept of a, of an observer which is needed in quantum mechanics is, is sort of a um, an informational exchange and it can be at the most general level so you have two billiard balls colliding or two photons colliding that's an exchange of information and therefore qualifies as an observer yeah my guess is that information is very much at the heart uh, of what an observer is. For the, for the simplest thing about predicting why quantum mechanics says you see probabilities, all you have to do is be able to store information. But I th think that consciousness itself also, it's all about information. And that consciousness is the way information feels when information is processed in certain very complicated ways. So ultimately, yeah. my old friend John Wheeler, he, he said he went through three stages in life. First, everything was particles, yeah. then everything was fields, yeah. and then everything was information. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm uh, with him on the third one there. Information seems so much at the heart of what an observer is and maybe what everything is about. Okay, it, it, but if that's the case, there's no easy um, uh, transition to consciousness. Uh, information can occur without life. 
there's information in a neutron star. Mm -hmm. I mean, so are you saying that there's an extra possible step that consciousness is, is somehow uh, something other than an accidental emergence of, uh, of what happened uh, on this isolated planet in this isolated galaxy? So my guess is that uh, you have to have information for there to be consciousness in an observer, but that's not enough. It can't be any old information processing. It has to be a, a certain very complex type of information processing. And there are some fascinating theories out there by Giulio Tononi and others, but we're still testing them and trying to figure out what precisely the yeah. information has to do. But that's going from information to what causes consciousness. But can you then have consciousness being fundamental in order to understand, in order, to, uh, in order for the quantum physics to work? So my hope and, and guess is that it can ultimately be unified and we can start with the usual physics of quarks and electrons and, and see how these can be thought of as systems that are processing information at a higher level right. and then how we can understand in turn consciousness as, as a higher level aspect of, of of certain kinds of information processing. So the ca the causal arrow is going from the the particles, the fields, to consciousness. Is there any causal arrow going in the other direction? That's my question. There is a causal arrow from bottom up, but but uh, I think it's too simplistic to say that our consciousness is just a bunch of electrons moving around or just a bunch of information because. Consciousness takes on kind of a life of its own, yeah, yeah, yeah. very much like a wave tra traveling across a lake takes on a life of its own. You can study the wave and talk about its wavelength and its speed and so on without even talking about what it's a wave in. I think that consciousness is the same kind of thing that, that ha takes on sort of a life of its own. That doesn't mean that... Um, Does it then have any causal impact going down? I prefer talking about, rather than impact, what is the most economical explanation of something? If I get hit by a big wave when I'm surfing, then uh, uh, rather than say, well, this water molecule and that water molecule and these other gazillion ones bumped into me, it's a much more economic explanation to say the wave hit me. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, if you choose with your conscious mind to ask me something, the more economical explanation is to say that it was your conscious mind that decided to do this, rather than giving a very long-winded but correct explanation in terms of 10 to the power 28 quarks. <laughs>